you are invited to turn with me to the scripture, Matthew 28, verses 18 to 27. spoken of during the message, but we let's read it together just so we're on the same page, all right? Yes, Pastor, yeah, good. <laughs> all right, are you with me? Yes. Chapter 21, <coughs> it says the fig tree withers in many. Oh, it's up there? <laughs> and just follow there, right? Early in the morning, I see he was on his way back. He was hungry. Seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it, but found nothing on it except leaves. Then he said to it, May you never bear fruit again. Immediately the tree withered. When the disciples saw this, they were amazed. How did the fig tree wither so quickly, they asked. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. If you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Jesus entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. On what authority are you doing these things? They asked. And who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or from earth? They discussed it among themselves and said, If we say from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say from men, we are afraid of the people, for they will hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. Then he said, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. The word of God to the people of God. Thanks be to God. So today our message is games people play. Um, <clears throat> how many of you actually are committed to a Lenten discipline? You're actually doing something for Lent. You said, I'm going to give something up or try to do more. Anybody committed? One, two, three, four. Not bad. Five. How many of you are actually doing it? Everybody that raised your hand so far? A little bit? You're not going to like today's message, you know. You're trying what? You were on time? Your time or our time? Uh, well, congratulations. Um, you know, a lot of people are saying, I, and I, we make these Lent promises like giving up Brussels sprouts when you didn't eat them anyway. <laughs> and I said, what are you doing for Lent? Oh, I'm praying. Well, you didn't pray before Lent? I'm trying to pray more. Are you doing it? Well, not really. We like to play games with ourselves. We like to play games with each other. But you know, we also like to play games with God. Who do we think we're fooling? Huh? Today's message, and the title actually came to me while I was thinking about Lent, and how we not only approach Lent, but our lives, how we approach our walk with Jesus. We play games. We play games. In 1968, Joe South released a song that started playing in my mind as I was thinking about all this, and I didn't, I didn't put it up here from YouTube, I don't think, but... I want you to hear the lyrics anyway, okay? He said, all the games people play now, every night and every day now, never meaning what they say now, never meaning what they say now, never saying what they mean. And then they while away the hours 
in their ivory towers, till they're covered up with flowers in the back of a black limousine, talking about you and me and the games people play. Oh, we make one another cry, break a heart and then we say goodbye, cross our hearts and we hope to die that the other was to blame. No one will give in, so we gaze at our eight by 10, thinking about the things that might have been, and it's a dirty, rotten shame. People walking up to you, singing glory, hallelujah, and they're trying to sock it to you in the name of the Lord. They're going to teach you how to meditate, read your horoscope, cheat your fate. And furthermore, to hell with hate, come on and get on board. Look around, tell me what you see. What's happening to you and me? God grant me the serenity to just remember who I am. Because you've given up your sanity for your pride and your vanity. Turn your back on humanity and you don't give a da, 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 da. <laughs> Talk about you and me and the games people play. Sometimes things just aren't what they seem, are they? Sometimes people are not what they seem. The Bible word for this is called hypocrisy. And the word literally means to act or assume a role of a counterfeit character. In Jesus' day, he was confronted with a number of hypocritical attitudes and religious people. And he spoke out against them. He spoke out against the game playing in their facades. And he challenged them to embrace true holiness. What is a big deal to embrace true holiness? Today, he makes the same challenge to us. We struggle with the same temptations to play religious games. The kind, that kind of hypocrisy is a major roadblock in our journey in life, in our journey to holiness as Christians. Lent is a great time for us to stop playing games and to get serious about our walk with the Lord. Now, I don't think anybody intentionally sets out to be a hypocrite. But what happens is that we allow ourselves to engage in some of these religious games instead of pursuing true, spiritual, biblical holiness. Today we're going to look at three out problem areas real quick. Three hypocritical games that we often play that stand in our way of becoming what God wants us to be. That's the problem. And we'll look at how we can eliminate these areas of hypocrisy from our lives. So we're in Matthew 21 and we read verse 18 and 19. Early in the morning as he was on his way back to the city, he... Jesus was hungry, and he sees a fig, a fig tree by the side of the road, and he finds nothing on that tree but leaves. And he says, may you never bear fruit again. Immediately, that fig tree withered. The first problem that we're going to address this morning is a lack of substance. Looking good without doing good. So at first, this story of the fig tree is a little bit confusing because it takes place in April, which is around Passover time, and that's not when fig trees bear fruit. Fig trees bear two crops a year, first one in June, second one in September. So when Jesus curses this fig tree for not having fruit, it appears that he's blaming the tree for not doing what it's unable to do in the first place. Typically in April, a fig tree will have little green knobs on the branches and the buds will eventually develop into a fig. Matthew says that when Jesus <coughs> looked at the fig tree, he found nothing on it except for leaves. In other words, no buds, no knobs, no promise of fruit, just leaves. No doubt this was a beautiful fig, a tree. A fig tree is a good looking tree, but it was useless. So Jesus cursed it. 
This story is actually one of Jesus' parables that he is acting out to remind us that outward beauty, an abundance of leaves on our branches, is not enough. In our lives, there's got to be fruit, the promise of more fruit to come. In this story, Jesus is condemning the game that we often play that consists of looking good without doing good. If we want to be serious, and I hope that we do, about following Jesus, we must refuse to settle for this appearance-only approach to life. Having a bunch of leaves is not enough. We need to strive to bear fruit. That's what being a fruitful congregation was all about. But we need to be fruitful witnesses for Jesus Christ individually. What does it mean to bear fruit? You know what it means? It means to live out our actions and our attitudes that fill the hunger of others. That's what it means to bear fruit. God is calling us to an others-oriented lifestyle. What we must do needs to be a benefit to others. Our lives must fill the, the hunger that is in other people, whether it's spiritual, physical, emotional, whatever it is, in one way or another, or else we're just a bunch of leaves. These are the questions I really believe that we need to start asking ourselves. How does what I do help other people? Is my life bearing the fruit of filling the hunger in others? Or am I just bearing leaves? Am I focused on looking good? Or am I focused on doing good? Ask yourself that when you're doing something. Sometimes we are so content to have the appearance of holiness rather than the real thing. We're content with looking good rather than doing good. This is a problem area that we need to watch out for. Focusing on surface level appearances rather than the substance in our lives. In the book of Isaiah, God said in Isaiah 29, 13, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. He's talking about looking good versus doing good. Our challenge is to get beyond those surface level appearances of our lives and delve into the substance of our lives. <laughs> Developing attitudes and actions that actually fill the hunger of others. That's the first problem area that we have to deal with. Looking good without doing good. Second, a lack of faith. Praying without power. Verse 20, when the disciples saw this, they were amazed. How did that fig tree wither so quickly, they asked. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. If you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what has been done to the fig tree, but also... You can say to this mountain, go throw yourself in the sea, and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Jesus makes a bold promise here concerning prayer. He says that if we pray in faith, we can move mountains. And so we just have got to look at our prayer and our prayer lives and ask, are there mountains in my life moving out of my way? Are those mountains moving out of my way? Am I seeing results in my prayer life? If mountains don't move when we pray, then there is something wrong. We are playing games with prayer. We're playing a game with our faith. We are flirting with hypocrisy. It's hypocritical 
for us to say, I believe that God loves me and wants the best for my life, and to not have the boldness to ask God's best in prayer. It's hypocritical to say that God has the desire to accomplish something in my life and the power to accomplish something in my life and not ask him to accomplish it. Jesus is challenging us here to pray bigger, bolder prayers. And he's challenging us to believe him to answer those prayers. But we want to play games. We want to play games with our prayers. We're afraid to pray big, bold prayers. We're afraid to speak to that mountain and tell it to move. And it's not because we don't believe in ourselves. It's because we don't believe in God. He made a promise, verse 22. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask in prayer. You say you believe the word of God? There it is. But we're afraid to believe. So we continue to pray benign, innocuous prayers that reflect nothing of God's power that is available to us. We gain nothing, but we risk nothing. And in doing so, we are flirting with hypocrisy. So you pray more than yours usual during the 40 days of Lent. Perhaps you sit in silence before God for a specified amount of time. You attend a weekly service. You say a certain prayer once a day. Keep this up. And in time, you may discover, in fact, it may be shown to you that our prayer is something poor. Dust and ashes before the majesty of an almighty God. We pray, or we think we do, and we discover, we discover a poverty of our prayer. We discover the emptiness of the words. We discover the shallowness of our silence. I'm challenging you during Lent to pursue a prayer project. Okay, a project in prayer. Think of something that you know without a doubt God wants to accomplish in your life. I'm not talking about material acquisitions or anything along that line. I am talking about things like a victory over sin, a restored relationship, starting an effective ministry, something you know God wants to accomplish in your life but has eluded you for so long. Then begin to pray for it in a big way. Begin praying for it in a big, bold way. Begin praying with absolute faith. Not faith in yourself and your own goodness, but faith in the power of God. Whatever obstacle, whatever mountain is standing in your way, begin praying with faith that the mountain will be moved. You will see results. And let me tell you, that's not my guarantee, it's God's. Jesus wants us to get beyond the religious games that we're playing and start living lives of faith. Mm. He wants us to get beyond the hypocrisy of saying that we believe in an all-powerful God, yet never doing anything to unleash that power in our lives. If you want to hit hypocrisy in your life head on, then start praying in faith and you'll start praying with power. A lack of substance, a lack of faith, and third, the problem in our area I want to look at <clears throat> is a lack of commitment. Avoiding the truth. Let's look at the next section, verse 23. <clears throat> Jesus entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders and the people came to him, by well, what authority are you doing these things, they asked. And who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will also ask you a question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. John's baptism, 
Where did it come from? Was it from heaven or from men? They discussed it among themselves and said, If we say from heaven, he will ask, then why do you believe him? But if we say from men, we are afraid of the people, for they hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We don't know. And then he said, Well, then neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. <clears throat> Jesus was not avoiding their question. He was pressing them for commitment. Throughout his ministry, he had always been clear about whose authority he was under. In the Gospel of John, John 5, 19, he says, I tell you the truth, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his Father doing, because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. He knew that those chief priests and the elders were trying to set a trap for him. But you know what? He wasn't about to take the bait. Instead, he zeroed in on an area of the hypocrisy in their lives. The fact that they were more concerned about public opinion than about the truth. William Barclay calls this the deliberately assumed ignorance of cowardice. The deliberately assumed ignorance of cowardice. He goes on to say, if a man consults expediency rather than principle, the first question will be not what is the truth, but what is safe to say. Not the truth, but what is safe to say. Again and again, his expediency will drive him to cowardly silence. As you look at these chief priests and these elders and their response, you see that they never seriously considered Jesus' question. They didn't say to one another, well, how about it, guys? What do you think? Was John from heaven or not? Was his baptism from heaven? There only was concern was how they could trap Jesus. Have you ever been in an argument with somebody who's been proven wrong, dead wrong, caught out there, and they refuse to admit it? The truth can be staring them right in their face, and they refuse to look at it. They are not interested in the truth. They are interested in having their way, in winning their side of the argument, whether or not it is right. It's this kind of arrogance that we have got to be on guard against. The kind of arrogance says that I don't want to hear the facts, my mind is already made up. When we develop that attitude, we are playing a religious game in which our religion consists of individual preference and personal opinion rather than a foundation of truth. When we close our eyes to the truth, we are courting hypocrisy. Instead, we need to remain teachable, and we need to keep our hearts open to the truth of what God wants to teach us. Now, hypocrisy, hypocrisy is not a pleasant subject to talk about especially when we consider how it relates to us personally. Nobody wants to be a hypocrite. But if we are not careful, hypocritical actions and attitudes will seep into our lives and will undermine our Christian life. I challenge you today to hit hypocrisy head on. Don't settle for surface level living. Seek out a life of substance. Don't settle for praying weak, ineffective prayers, quick little help me Lord prayers. Seek the power of God in your prayer life. Seek it. And don't settle for deliberately assumed ignorance. Look for the courage to pursue the knowledge of the truth. No more playing games. Amen? Let's pray.
Merciful God, we are surrounded by temptations to judge based on appearance, to live only skin deep, to pursue what is flashy rather than what is substantive in our lives after the shallow values of the world that we are drawn away by. Lord, how we need a renewed vision of Christ this Lenten season. Speak to us again about what life in you is all about, serving those who can offer nothing in return, loving those who are different or friendless, forgiving and reconciling with our enemies, trusting you rather than ourselves. We acknowledge that we cannot do this on our own, but only by your Spirit. Come, Lord <coughs> Jesus, transform our hearts that we might reflect you in all we are, in all we think, and in all we do. We ask it.